Welcome again to a candidates forum sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Northwest Wayne County. My name is Anne Abdu and I'll be moderating the second part of the forum for the 19th District State House of Representatives. There are two candidates running. They are Republican Brian Meekin and Dem Democrat Lori Pahutsky. The 19th District covers the city of Livonia except for the northeast corner. The candidates were asked to prepare for a one minute opening statement and each will be allowed a one minute to respond to questions and two minute closing statement. Mr. Meekin, will you introduce yourself and give your opening statement? Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting tonight's forum. I am Brian Meekin. I'm running for state representative in the 19th district here in Livonia. This election is very important, and we need to continue the comeback that Michigan is facing. I'd like to thank my opponent, Lori Pahutsky, for starting her career in the Public Service Avenue. I'd like to share a pertinent quote with you from President Ronald Reagan. Government is not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. Let me repeat that. Government is the problem. We need to work together to promote job growth and remove red tape. I hope by the end of this forum, your decision will be pretty clear. On November 6th, I would appreciate your vote so we can keep Michigan on its comeback. Thank you. Ms. Pahutsky. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum and everyone for coming out tonight. My name is Lori Pahutsky and I'm running to be the next state representative here in Livonia. I'm running because as a scientist, I'm alarmed by the lack of evidence-based policy in our legislature. Science and evidence are not partisan, they don't have an agenda, and if we as a state are going to have laws based in science, then we need to have a scientist in the room. As a microbiologist, I've worked in the field of healthcare doing cancer testing to help doctors determine the best course of treatment. I've worked in water testing to determine if local farms were affecting water quality. And throughout my campaign, I have kept my day job because like many in our community, my husband and I rely on two incomes. So I know what it's like to be a working class Michigander because I am one. I'm running because your interests are mine and they need to be represented here in Michigan. Uh, the first question, Mr. Meekin. Many people in lower wage positions are being replaced by technology. For instance, McDonald's kiosk to order your food and grocery store self-checkout counters. What would you propose to help these people to find gainful employment? Well, I believe that is a direct correlation to the minimum wage increase. Other communities have found out every time they increase the minimum wage, they have to reduce their employees. So they create technology to eliminate people. That's not how we need to work. We need to have people working in our communities. Thank you. Ms. Pahatsky. I think that we need to invest in companies and jobs that are willing to train workers that have been cut out of industries. There are industries that have left Michigan and are never coming back. There are jobs that are being replaced by automation. And if we are going to give tax breaks to any corporations, they need to be willing to train our workers here in Michigan so that they aren't getting these tax breaks for free. They are getting them in exchange for putting down roots and investing in a community that they are asking for an investment from. Ms. Pahatsky, if elected, you will need to reach agreements with others whose interests may be in direct conflict with yours. When was the last time you collaborated with people you disliked or disagreed with to get something important done? So in the laboratory, in the field of science, there are many different groups that are all trying to get to the same goal. So you have me, I'm, I'm the data geek, I do the testing. Uh, you have quality, you have regulatory, you have people who are only concerned about deadlines. And those, those paths to the same goal can all seem at, at odds at times. Everyone's trying to do their job as best they can and that may not uh, jive very well with, with other departments. And it's important to remember that you are all working towards the same goal. You are all looking to accomplish the same thing. And it's important to make sure that you treat each other with respect on the way there. 
Mr. Meekin. On the Lower City Council, we face that, face that on a weekly basis. We had one particular case this past year was the redevelopment of Clay Schools um, off Newburgh Road and Six Mile. It was a very um, heated debate. We had a room full of residents, a developer who wanted to redevelop the school, and then the city. I mean, this side wanted one thing, the other side wanted another thing. But we worked together and came up with a solution that everyone could handle. I was very proud of the work that the Lonely City Council did in redeveloping Clay Schools. That's going to be a beautiful development here in Livonia, bringing homes and new families to the city. Mr. Meekin, the state legislature just passed a bill to raise the minimum wage in Michigan, which eliminated the plan ballot proposal on this issue. If the next legislature seeks to undo the impact of this bill, what would your position be? Well, I'd have to explore it, first of all. Um, I'm not a proponent of raising the minimum wage, but the, the wage I currently have is not the highest, so I, I'm not overly worried about it, and I'm not uh, interested in reducing it at this time. So I don't know what my answer would be come January. Ms. Bohatsky. I have very serious concerns about legislators trying to get around ballot initiatives. I think that that is usually a reflection of the fact that they do not want voter turnout to be as high as it might be, or they are trying to slip something else into that piece of legislation. So with that being said, until we find out what exactly is going to come through with the ballot initiative that they then turned into a bill, I, I can't say that I would support either um, the legislation itself or overturning it because we simply don't know what is going to come out of it. But the, the most important take home, in, in my opinion, is that the legislature should not try and get around the will of the voters. Ms. Pahatsky, if elected, what would you do to make yourself available to your constituents? So we have been knocking doors on my campaign, myself personally, um, since May of 2017. I have made sure that everyone I meet and anyone whose vote I'm asking for knows how to get a hold of me. I meet that through email, phone, uh, my website. But I've also been very clear that if I know where voters are when I'm asking them for a vote, I need to know where they are when I need to be held accountable to them. That might include continuing to go door to door during um, the course of, of the term or uh, opening up an office here in Livonia. I think that it is important that um, a legislator remain an open resource to the community and there are several ways of doing that but I think we need to make sure that they are more accessible rather than less. Mr. Meekin. As an elected official, I'm available basically 24-7. I get calls at home on the weekends, whenever the residents require. And as your state representative, I'll also hold office hours here in Livonia. But probably most importantly, I'll give everyone my cell phone number. My personal cell phone number is 734-718-4821. I can be reached at any time. Okay, Mr. Meekin, what would you do to fix the roads in Michigan? Would you raise the fee on large trucks? We have to explore many avenues before we start raising fees. A fee is a tax, and I'm not interested in raising taxes or fees at this time. We have to go back and explore Act 51. That was our gas tax that provides the funding for our roads. <clears throat> Obviously, the road situation was much different back in 1951 than it is today. So we do have to explore that program for funding our roads. Um, we've done a good job of funding our roads in the last few years, but we need more. So we have to explore every other avenue we can before we increase any fee. Ms. Bohatsky. I do support lowering the weight restriction on trucks that come through here. Uh, currently, trucks are allowed to carry significantly heavier loads through Michigan than in most other states, and our roads show that. So I think that that weight restriction needs to be lowered. We need to open up the weigh stations that are frequently closed along our highways so that they can be enforced, and any fines that we collect because of violations need to go back into our infrastructure. 
I think that we also need to look at different materials that are more durable and made to last so that we aren't doing temporary fixes throughout the year. And I also want to look into getting warranties for some of our roadways. There is no reason that our roads should be deteriorating as quickly as they are. Ms. Pahatsky, recently a study was done that said we should be funding schools at $8,900 per student. How would you fund schools to bring up per pupil funding to that level? So in November, it is likely that uh, recreational marijuana is going to be legalized. That remains to be seen as whether that will be a positive or a negative overall, but what it will do is create a significant amount of tax revenue. And per the ballot proposal, that revenue is to go into education. And I think that that is an important way that we can increase tax, or I'm sorry, we can increase funding to our schools. Um, another thing that we need to do is no longer allow our tax dollars to go to for-profit charter schools. Those schools do not have to follow the same standards and they do not have to accept all of the students that our public schools do. It is unfair to be giving tax dollars that are definitely needed by our public schools to for-profit charter schools. Mr. Meekin. Jennifer Granholm previously cut the 20J funds from the Bologna Public Schools and that put a hurting on our schools. We've been playing catch up ever since. The previous, um, or the <coughs> current administration has been working to increase public school fundings on a yearly basis. But that's not enough. We need to explore every avenue we can to increase funding for our local schools. Hey, Mr. Meekin, would you support legislation that would require equal pay for women? Why or why not? Of course I would support something for equal pay for, equal, or for women. I am a small business owner. I have myself, who's the president of the company, and I have my sister. She makes more than I do. <laughs> and she'll be happy to tell you that. But I'm also happy to tell you that, and I'm very proud of her for that. You know, there's many industries where women are the breadwinners, and it's important that they're getting equal pay to equal jobs according to, or with men. So I support women having equal pay. Ms. Bohusky. I fully support equal pay for equal work. Um, we have seen that sexism is still very much present in our society. And I think it's important to note that while women make about 70 cents on the dollar uh, in accordance with men, women of color make even less than that. And we need to be very cognizant of the fact that that rate of pay disparity is more um, noticeable when you are a, a woman of color. So while we need to address systemic sexism, we also need to address systemic racism because that is also very much present here in Michigan. Okay, Ms. Bohutsky, do you support the marijuana proposal on this November ballot? Why or why not? I think that the marijuana proposal will increase a significant amount of funding for our state. I think that it is funding that is needed for our public schools. It is needed for our infrastructure. Other states that have legalized recreational marijuana have seen a decrease in opioid abuse, and I think that that is something we need to keep in mind. I am supportive of the ballot initiative because it seems that it has bipartisan support from the public. Again, as I mentioned earlier, at the end of the day, that is something the voters get to decide on. And if voters choose to legalize recreational marijuana, then the state needs to honor that. Um, I think that there could be several benefits for our state economically, and it's something that we should um, be, be open to if that's something that the voters choose to do. Mr. Beacon. Well, I completely disagree with my opponent. Uh, or marijuana is not an avenue for economic growth. Look at Colorado. It's not been a success there. Nevada's starting to say the same thing and they just approved it. Look at the people coming to work every day with under legalized marijuana. Could you be a truck driver? No. Could you work in a machine shop? No. I mean, you can't come into work under the influence of marijuana. How are they keeping their cash? Right now you go to one of these facilities, all their cash is in a big room because they can't use banks in the federal system. So there's just way too many negatives that I see for providing legalized marijuana in this community. 
Mr. Meekin, what would you do to make charter and cyber schools accountable? Well, it's not just cyber and charter schools. I think all schools should be accountable. We need to make sure that every child out there has a quality education, whether that's charter, cyber, public, everything. Our children are our most important asset that we have, and we have to do a better job of teaching our kids reading, writing, and arithmetic. Funding of that shouldn't be an issue. We need to educate our children to the best of our ability. Ms. Bohatsky. As I touched on earlier, charter and cyber schools do not have the same regulations, or nor do they have to meet the same standards as our public schools. That is basic, um, particularly if they want our tax dollars, which I'm opposed to. But regardless, children deserve an education. Um, schools should not be able to cherry pick children. They should not be able to get out of meeting the same basic standards that our public schools do. That is the most basic way that we can hold them accountable by making sure that they are required to educate children the same way our public schools are. Okay. I was just told to speak louder. <laughs> um, let's see. Can you hear me better this way? I can hear you fine. What do you think of a part-time legislature from Michigan, Ms. Bohutsky? When we already have term limits in place for our legislature, um, I think that if we also take the legislature down to part-time, they are going to be less effective than they already are. In a perfect world, we would not have to worry about legislators getting up to Lansing and, and playing partisan politics and you know, looking out for their own self-interest. We are not in a perfect world. That is why term limits exist, and I understand that. But if we further um, you know, take power and um, just opportunity away from our legislature to work together and work towards legislation, we're going to see even less get done here in our state. Mr. Meekin. I do not agree with a part-time legislature. It's not only the time that you're in Lansing, it's the time that you're in the district. Um, but if for some reason the people of Michigan determined that we should have a part-time legislature and create, create a ballot initiative and it gets passed, I'd have no problem working as a part-time legislature. It doesn't matter to me whether it's full-time or part-time. I'm here to serve. Mr. Meekin, how do you propose to be effective in office if a political party other than yours wins majority control of the House? Well, it's not about who's in control of the House. It's communication. As a councilman, I've worked with my friend, Maureen miller Brosnan for 10 years. We've gone back and forth on issues for years. I've worked with her very closely to get legislation done and economic development here in Livonia. All it takes is communication. You just gotta reach across the aisle. Ms. Bohutsky. There are issues that both parties wanna work together on. And I think that Working on those together will build trust, it will build respect, and that is a relationship that you can continue to build on even when you don't particularly see eye to eye with one another. So I think that it's very important to, as Brian said, maintain good communication with other members of the legislature, even if they are not the same party as you, and just maintain a respectful relationship and keep in mind that we're all working towards a better Michigan. We just might not always agree on how to do that. <clears throat> Ms. Bohutsky, please discuss what policy you support that addresses gun violence in schools. In particular, what is your stand on arming teachers? I've been named a, a gun sense candidate by Moms Demand Action. I fully support the Second Amendment. I understand that it is a right that we have here in this country. That being said, I think that there are some common sense regulations that we can put in place, um, such as red flag laws. And when it comes to guns being allowed in schools or arming teachers, I do not support that whatsoever. Schools are places where emotions run very high, as it is. Uh, many teachers that I've talked to do not want the liability of having a gun in the classroom. There's always the chance that children may get it. Um, if, God forbid, a teacher has to use it, that opens them up to legal action. This is not something teachers want to do. This is not what they signed up for, and it overall makes our schools less safe. Mr. Meekin. 
I'm certainly glad that the Lonely Public Schools has taken the lead on this issue. They have already provided a hardened school system where entrances are secure, where they've also had resource officers who are <coughs> properly trained and armed. That is the, what I believe the proper way to do this. We should be increasing funding for our resource officers throughout the state. However, if a teacher is a CPL holder, I would not have a problem if she were carrying a weapon in the school systems. Mr. Meekin, do you think there should be changes to the length of the term limits for state legislatures? What would you propose? Uh, yes, I do. I think the term limits for the state legislature has been a failure. Um, currently, it's two, two or three two-year terms. <coughs> Many of these elected officials, their first year in, they're running for another office by the time the second one is starting. So I don't think it's enough time, <coughs> excuse me, to learn your position the way it should be. And then it's creating the lobbyists to have more control, <coughs> excuse me, over the legislators. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't agree that the term limits, I would suggest maybe eight to 10 years would be a reasonable term limit. It, it can't be unlimited, I agree with that, but eight to ten years would be more appropriate. Ms. Pahatsky. I do think that term limits tie the hands of our legislators um, quite frequently because as, as Brian mentioned, by the time they really gain traction, they're you know, no longer allowed to run again. That being said, um, like, like I mentioned earlier, if, if we were in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to worry about the wrong people getting into an office and then us not being able to get them out. There are things that we need to look into, including increased governmental transparency, um, getting some of this corporate money out of politics so that it's harder for people to get elected and then stay elected when we want to vote them out. Until that happens, while I think that we could certainly lengthen the term limits, um, I don't know if eight to 10 years is appropriate, but they, they could be lengthened. But that being said, I think that we have some more important cleaning up to do in our legislature before we get to that step. <clears throat> Ms. Bohudski, what is your position on ballot initiative two to end gerrymandering in district in Michigan and establish an independent commission to handle redistricting? I fully support the Voters Not Politicians voter initiative, I'm sorry, ballot initiative. Uh, they are a grassroots group that has done amazing things. And I agree that voters should have a voice when they're casting their ballot. And politicians, whether it be Democrats or Republicans, should not be deciding how these districts are drawn. Um, both parties have, have played a role in that, and we are seeing the, the disastrous consequences now. So I fully support a um, independent committee redrawing those districts and making sure that every person's vote counts. Mr. Meekin. While every ballot initiative needs to be studied, I do not agree with this one particularly. Um, gerrymandering has been a problem for decades. Adding a group of nonpartisan or from each party doesn't help the situation. I believe our state re representatives and the state legislature are our representative. They speak for the people of the state and they should determine what the district should be. I'm also not interested when out of state organizations like Eric Holder and uh, contribute large sums of money to fund local initiatives in Michigan. Mr. Meekin, some people in Lansing have proposed eliminating the income tax and pre replacing it with a 15% con consumption <coughs> tax to eliminate loopholes and make sure people pay their fair share. Do you support that? Why or why not? I'm not sure if I support it right now. I would explore avenues of reducing the income tax or even eliminating it altogether. But we have to have the full story of what's behind all the rest of it. it it's not just a simple equation. Ms. Bohatsky. I do, do not support uh, the consumption tax and doing away with the income tax. That assumes that every person um, is bringing the same amount of money, essentially. And we already have issues with the working class in Michigan being overburdened, while people up at the top, the top 1%, wealthy corporations, are not required to pay their fair share. So making it a uniform 
fee across the board is not going to solve that problem. That is still going to require that people, people who have less pay just as much. And so no, I do not support that. Uh, Ms. Pahusky, how can the legislator, legislature best support university level education and research? So one thing that we need to do to um, help university level education is make sure that we are not allowing our universities to court out-of-state students to the detriment of our in-state students. Um, I'm a graduate of Michigan State University and in the, the four years that I spent there, um, there were so many unnecessary additions and renovations done that were coming out of my tuition. My tuition was going up to fund those and those are put in place to try and lure out-of-state students and um, our, our in-state students are paying the price for that ultimately, and that's something that we need our universities to be accountable for. They need to prioritize our in-state students. Mr. Meekin. Well, I disagree with the fact that we should be spending more on our research institutions for graduate work. Uh, we need to be focusing on lowering, lower education systems so we can create more skilled jobs, skilled trades jobs in this community working with Schoolcraft College and the other local colleges to get people to, to look at uh, to becoming a carpenter or a plumber, electrician. Those are the kind of jobs that we need to be focusing on. The, the research universities need to start spending their endowments that they've been sitting on for year after year. Billions of dollars are sitting there. They can use that money to fund their research projects. Mr. Meekin, as legacy costs increase, are you in favor of lowering public sector pensions that were already negotiated. Will you take away retirement health care to save money? Well, I believe that decision has already been made uh, at the state level and even at the local level here in Livonia. Um, pensions uh, have, our pension system here in Livonia has been closed since 1997 and our health care system has been um, closed since 2012. Uh, however, as the chairman of the Livonia Employees Retirement System, it is my obligation to make sure that the funds are there for their retirement. Everyone who has a pension and has retiree health care will be receiving those benefits with no reductions at all. Ms. Bohutsky. I am absolutely not in favor of that. If people were promised a, a certain amount of pension and a certain standard of health care, it is not fair to take that away from them. That is what they were promised. and. People should not have to pay, regular citizens should not have to pay for a lack of foresight on the behalf of government. Ms. Pahutsky, um, do you support the ballot initiative to make voting more convenient? I absolutely support making voting more convenient. I support um, absentee voting for no, for no reason, no stated reason. Um, I support um, voter reg mandatory, or I'm sorry, automatic voter registration at the Secretary of State. Um, I, I think that voting is one of the greatest privileges and rights that we have in this state. And the fact that it is made purposefully difficult for certain people is abhorrent. We absolutely need to be making voting easier and more convenient for everybody, unilaterally. Mr. Meekin. While I agree we need to make voting simpler for everyone, I disagree with this ballot initiative. There's a long list of items that just don't make any sense, especially straight ticket balloting. You know, people who are in the phone usually vote for the best person. It's not right that they can just go in and put one circle and vote for 25 different people, whether they know them or not. So I'm not in favor of many of the initiatives that are on that proposal. Who are the big, uh, Mr. Meekin, who are the biggest contributors to your campaign? Well, you're looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> I've contributed $5,000 of my own funds to my campaign. Uh, we've asked many friends and neighbors to contribute as well, and we'll continue to ask people throughout the state of Michigan. Ms. Pahutsky. I think we're seeing a theme here. I am also the biggest contributor to my campaign to date. Um, the second biggest is the Women in Leadership Fund. Um, we have many, many individual donors, and I'm very grateful for them because this is truly a grassroots campaign. And my campaign has shown people what they can demand out of the people they are looking to elect. Um, you can demand accountability, you can demand transparency. 
Um, I am proud that I have taken no corporate money, nor will I. My goal is to remain accountable to the people I am asking to elect me and not some corporation. Okay, Ms. Bohutsky, what do you think should be done with line five? Line five needs to be shut down. I make no qualms about that. Um, it is not safe. Studies have shown that if it bursts, it will cost $6 billion to clean up and affect the environment for at least the next 20 years. Um, that is a Canadian pipeline. It goes from Canada and back up to Canada. Uh, the small amount of propane that they supply to the UP, Enbridge has already said, they will continue to supply, even if that pipeline is shut down. It is in perilous condition. We cannot risk an oil spill to the Great Lakes. I cannot believe that in 2018 I have to make that statement, but we cannot. So I fully support shutting down Line 5. Mr. Meekin. Well, I had to <coughs> disagree with that statement because as we all know, winter's coming. If we shut down Line 5, how is the Upper Peninsula going to receive their gasoline and oil? We can't do that to the Upper Peninsula. We can't afford that economically. There are technical um, things they can do for Line 5, like sleeving the um, line. We do that here in Livonia currently. There are other, other things that the legislature and the governor are currently working on to make sure that nothing happens to Line 5. So we have to keep it open to keep the Upper Peninsula viable and the economy moving. Mr. Meekin, Michigan has one of the lowest ratings for governmental transparency. Would you support the application of the Freedom of Information Act, Act to the legislature and the governor's office? Uh, currently, as a city councilman, I am foyable. So I do support uh, elected officials being foyable. Ms. Bohutsky. Absolutely. The fact that Michigan comes last in, in terms of governmental transparency is shameful. It is absurd that Dana can be FOIA'd, but people who are elected representatives in our legislature cannot. Um, we, we have an issue with trusting our government, and I think that that is one big step we can take, and one that should already be in place, to be honest. Other states have programs to train and assist those coming out of prisons into jobs and places to live. This has reduced crime recidivism. Would you support such a program? Why or why not? Ms. Bohutsky. I would absolutely support a program like that. When we have people who are nonviolent offenders and we are asking them to you know, not turn back to crime, but we give them no resources in order to do that, we do need to make it easier for these people to re-enter the job force and, and to train them for, for a field that will allow them to earn a decent living and not turn back to crime and not end up in prison again. Mr. Meekin. Our goal is obviously rehabilitation. Anytime we can train somebody after they get out of prison, it's a worthwhile adventure. We want people to be productive members of society. There are also many nonprofit organizations that are more than willing to help out in this category. Um, Mr. Meekin, um, Senator Patrick Colbeck proposed removing references to the KKK and Roe versus Wade um, from the state's history books. He also wanted to remove the word democratic from references to this country's democratic values. What is your view of these proposed changes? I do not believe we can rewrite history. If you want to write a book, write a book, but we can't change the wordings that's already been written. Ms. Bohutsky. I agree. I think that these changes are absurd. Um, we are never going to learn anything if we keep trying to whitewash our history. What has happened has happened. What laws are in place are in place. It is ridiculous that this is the venture that one of our elected officials has decided to go on. Ms. Bohutsky, how would you differentiate yourself from your opponent? I think that I am more concerned about evidence-based policy, bringing a voice to working class Michiganders. Um, I am someone who has spent her adult life being an activist. 
um, which ironically is oftentimes diametrically opposed to politics. I, ran, I began running for office because I saw a lack of representation in our legislature. And I think that we are seeing now more than ever, people are tired of, of a lack of representation. Um, so I, I am running because I'm a working class Michigander. I am a scientist, I'm a woman. Um, these are groups that are not um, reflected in our government and I think it's time that they were. Mr. Meekin. Well, first off, I'm a small business owner. I've been an elected official for 13 years. I have the experience to legislate. When we start January 1st, I'll be ready to go on day one. I've done this job here in Livonia. Livonia has a great reputation as a well-run community, and I'm quite proud of that. Um, I want to take the experience that I have here and do good things in Lansing as well, and I think I can do that. And I look forward to the opportunity to serve in Lansing. Mr. Meekin, do you support the continuation of healthy of the Healthy Michigan program? Why or why not? Uh, no, I do not. I, I just don't think more government health care is a means of um, lowering the cost of anything. I'd rather have the private sector create health care or across state lines, there's many things that we can do to lower the cost of health care throughout the country. Ms. Bohutsky. Well, I support the Healthy Michigan program. Um, I, I know many people who have benefited from it. Um, I am actually a supporter of state-funded single-payer health care. Health care is a human right, and as it stands, our federal government is not willing to take up that responsibility. I think we need to implement it at the state level. So while I support the Healthy Michigan Plan, I personally think that we can do better. And there are people in the legislature who are already forming these bills, and I'd be happy to work with them once I'm elected. Okay, Ms. Bohutsky, as a candidate, you are asking voters to cast a vote for you. What is your personal voting record? Like, have you voted in all elections? I have. I have voted in... Every election, I may have missed a primary when I was in college, I won't lie to you. Um, <laughs> but um, I have certainly voted in all of the generals and most of the primaries. Um, and in addition to that, I try and always be an informed voter. I don't just go in and, and vote for name recognition. I try to learn about the candidates themselves. I try to learn about the ballot initiatives. That way I can go in and know exactly who I'm voting for and whether or not their values align with mine and what ballot initiatives, initiatives I support and which ones I think might help our state or our country in the long term and which ones I, I don't care for supporting. Mr. Meekin. Well, I can tell you this. I've voted in every election in this community for the past 20 years, whether that is a primary, a general, a special, a school board race, um, or any other election that we've had here in the city. Um, I think it is our right to get out and vote, and it is our duty as citizens to vote every single time we have that opportunity. Okay, Mr. Meekin, do you think taxpayer dollars should be used to help MSU pay the $500 million settlement to Larry Nasser's victims? Well, do I think it should be used? No. But reality says it's going to be used because it's a public school. Um, state funds, our tax dollars are going to go for those settlements. Um, is it right? No, but it's going to happen because I, I see no other way that Michigan State's going to come up with money like that to pay for things. And it's completely wrong. The, these victims deserve every penny they're going to get, but uh, they are going to get their pay. Ms. Bohutsky. Absolutely not. Um, and I am not content with just settling for, well, that's the way it has to be. What happened at MSU is shameful. I have been very vocal about the fact that as a former student, I know there is a culture problem on that campus. It goes far beyond Larry Nasser, and it is something that that university needs to address, and they do not get to use taxpayer dollars in order to get out of this mess. Absolutely not. Ms. Bohutsky. If you don't win the election, how will you contribute to this community outside the sphere of elective office? 
I have spent my entire adult life as a volunteer and an activist. I, uh, at one point in time when I was in college, was a volunteer at the local crisis center. Um, I am currently a volunteer at Angela Hospice here in Livonia. Um, I have been members of, I have been a member of the Gay Straight Alliance on MSU's campus. I am currently a member of the Livonia Democratic Club, Indivisible. Um, I do trainings for Michigan People's Campaign. I do not intend to just take my toys and go home. If I lose this election, we have work to do regardless of the outcome. Mr. Meekin. Well, if I'm not elected to the State House, that means I'd probably continue to serve on the Lone City Council. But in addition to the Lone City Council, I serve as the president of the Lone Community Foundation. That's a permanent endowment to help local 501c3s here in Livonia, which I'm extremely proud of. It was established in 1996, and to date we have close to $1.4 million. On average, we give $40,000 a year to local charities to help them benefit the Livonia community. Mr. Meekin, do you support voters providing identification like a driver's license or state ID at the polls to vote on election day? Yes, I do. I mean, we can't go anywhere without showing an ID. I mean, that's the least we should be, have to do is show some kind of ID to, in order to vote. Um, when we go to the Democratic Party has to show an ID to get to their convention. The Republicans do the same thing, so the least we can do is show ID to vote. It's such an important duty that we have. We have to make sure it's secure, and that's the least we can do. Ms. Bohutsky. I think the important part of that is the state ID that you mentioned. Uh, you have to show a membership ID to get into the Democratic convention. You do not have to show your driver's license. And we need to keep in mind that voter ID laws are based in racism. We know this. Um, I, I understand that um, we need to protect the integrity of our voting systems. That being said, there are ways to do it that are not disenfranchising and making it more difficult for people of color or people from lower income communities to vote. Okay, Ms. Bohutsky, what is your stance on the current state of LGBTQ rights? I support expanding the Elliott Larson Act to include the LGBTQ plus community. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that it is 2018 and there are members of our community that are still not treated equally, that still face discrimination and it is legal to discriminate against them is um, disgusting, frankly. <laughs> So I support any measure that we can to make sure that um, the members of the LGBTQ community are protected and are treated as equals. Mr. Meekin. I believe every many member of our community should be protected and treated as equals. But I do not agree that we should create a list of who we're protecting and who we're not. All men are created equally. So I believe it's already taken care of in our laws that everyone should be treated the same. So I, I don't want to see us keep adding different things to include in how we treat people. We're separating ourselves as it is. Let's go back to basics and treat everybody well. Mr. Meekin, how have you or will you determine how a majority of your constituents want you to vote on a given issue? Well, that's pretty simple because I've been doing it for years. You listen. You listen to your neighbors. You listen to the people at the grocery store who stop and ask you a question. You know, you read their emails, you communicate. This is, job is about communication from your constituents near and far. It doesn't matter what you're doing, you have to listen to their opinion and you vote for how your constituency wants you to vote. Ms. Bohutsky. So coffee hours and town halls are the most obvious answer to that question, and those are great things. But that being said, I think that our, our elected officials need to make more of an effort to go to our community where they are. Um, I've been campaigning now since March of 2017. Um, if I knew where to find my constituents that entire time, then I can know where to find you afterwards when I need to hear how you'd like me to vote. Um, so, you know, the same community events, the same groups that I've been going to this entire time, I will continue to attend when I'm elected, an elected official. 
and if there are scheduling issues, I will still make time to come to the community and find out what they think is important. Mr. Meekin. Can you repeat the oh. question? I think I oh, that. You answered it. <laughs> Ms. Bohutsky, what are your thoughts and opinions on taxing retirement accounts? I am completely opposed to taxing retirees. I have been speaking to the community um, for about a year and a half now, and that is one of the top issues that I hear from, or that I hear about. Um, we have a large retired community here in our district. That retirement tax is very detrimental to them. Um, it is unfair to ask someone who has been paying into a system their entire life to then give more when that was not budgeted for. They are having enough time living on a fixed income trying to make ends meet with rising health care costs, with rising prescription drug costs. It is absurd to be taxing their pensions on top of it. Mr. Meekin. I would vote to repeal the tax on seniors' income. I've heard it from uh, seniors at the Senior Center, Silver Village, Newbrook Village, across this great city. I even heard it just yesterday at a door that I was knocking on. She said, these senior taxes are killing us. Not only the senior pe or pension tax, but the water bill. The fixed water is killing us, um, killing those of us on fixed income. So we have to explore how we're taking care of that. Okay. Mr. Meekin, in most other countries, all citizens have health care at reasonable cost or free. What would you do to ensure that all Michigan residents have health care coverage? Well, <clears throat> I'm opposed to national or state funded health care. I believe it should be a private sector uh, industry. Um, in Ten years ago, before Obamacare took over, the business community took care of a large percentage of it. Now, we have um, more people in need that need to be covered, and those should be covered. And I'm, we could have government funding for them, but we shouldn't be taking care of the 80 percent of the people out there that have that have cover health care available to them. You know, this single payer health care, whether it's state or nationally funded, how do we pay for it? Give me a solid reason. The government just said it was going to cost us 31 trillion dollars to fund a single payer health care. How do we pay for that? We can't fix our roads as it is. How do we pay for it? Healthcare is not a right. It's never been written anywhere that it's a right. We need to provide health care, but not by single payer system. Oh, it's time. Okay. Ms. Bohutsky. Well, I think that also answers the earlier question about how Brian and I differ. Um, health care is a human right. And um, in terms of paying for a state funded single payer health care, I have discussed at length um, the implementation of a progressive graduate income tax that would require corporations in the top 1% in the state to pay their fair share without overburdening the working class. I do not think that is going to be a simple undertaking. I understand that. That being said, it is inexcusable that there are 600,000 people in the state that do not have health care. Um, I, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, I believe that it is not your employer's job to provide you with health care. There was a time when that was not even a consideration. So I do not think that we need to continue privatizing healthcare. Um, insurance companies themselves are looking to turn a profit. And when we put people over profits, people never, or I'm sorry, um, people win. So that's what I support. Okay, this will be your last question. Since state prisons are privately owned, their motive is filling cells um, that can pro be processed by, oh, I don't, I'm not sure what this. Maybe that's a question you should have replaced. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try this again. Since state prisons are privately owned, their motive is filling cells, um, not rehabilitation. Um, how do you think this should change? I think that we need to end privatization of prisons. Um, we have seen it have disastrous consequences, even going down to our schools. When you look at things like the school-to-prison pipeline, 
Um, again, that goes back to putting profits before people, and that is not how our state should operate. Uh, prisons should be focused on rehabilitation, not just turning a profit for a CEO of some corporation that wants to own one. Mr. Mika. I believe most of the prisons in the state of Michigan are state funded, not privatized. So we're spending millions of dollars every year uh, with state dollars to protect or to house our prisoners. Um, is there a good use for privatized prisons? Sure there are. If they can do it for a lower cost, rehabilitate them, and move them, make them productive people in society, absolutely. Um, let's lower the cost of housing our prisoners first, and then we can get rid of get people off of our government control. Let's get them out of the prisons and into the community. It's now time for your closing statements. Um, Ms. Podsky, will you begin? So again, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters and Brian for um, hosting and attending the forum tonight. Events like these are so important because as someone who is asking for your vote, I owe you accountability and transparency. I pride myself on being a candidate who is willing to answer tough questions and remain accessible. And that's something that I will carry on after I'm elected. As I mentioned earlier, I've been knocking doors in our community for a year and a half. And I've learned so much about my neighbors here in Livonia. I've learned that we have more in common than divides us. I have learned that we all have concerns about rising healthcare costs and a pharmaceutical company that is out of control. We're all worried for our struggling public education system and know that our educators in the community and the students that they teach deserve better. We are all outraged at the fact that so many communities in our state do not have clean, safe water to drink, and corporations are allowed to pollute our state with little to no consequence, including here in Livonia at the Ford Transmission Plant. These are issues that we can all unite behind. My platform is all about putting the residents of this city and their needs ahead of corporations and special interests. The question isn't whether, well, whether people-first, evidence-based solutions are right for Livonia, the question is why our career politicians haven't been ready for them. I'm committed to working towards them in the Michigan House of Representatives. So I'm asking that when you look at your ballot, <clears throat> you keep in mind that I will work for you, not wealthy donors and corporations, and I will always make your best interests my top priority. So I'm asking that you vote for me, Lori Bohutsky, to be your next state representative. Thank you. Mr. Meekin. Well, I'd like to thank Ann and the League of Women Voters for hosting this evening's forum. I am Brian Beacon, I'm running for state representative in the 19th district here in Livonia. This is such an important election. Michigan has had an incredible comeback and we need that to continue. Livonia has a great reputation for being a well-run community and I take great pride in my role as a councilman. I'd like to take my 13 years of experience and take that to Lansing to build on those successes. Whether it's working with county and state government to fix the crumbling roads, or fix the seven mile, which was a crumbling road. We approved body cameras to protect our police officers. We established the Livonia Community Transit System to transport our seniors to doctor's appointments and social activities. Lowering taxes whenever possible is key. Keeping Livonia as the lowest rated tax rated city in Wayne County has been vital. I'm asking for your help this November to keep Michigan on the right track, fighting for our seniors, fixing our roads, and lowering taxes. I did it for you in Livonia. I can do it for you in Lansing as well. I ask for your vote on November 6th to keep Michigan on its comeback. Thank you. We'd like to thank the candidates who participated in tonight's forums for the 7th District State Senate and the 19th District State House. We thank the City of Livonia for allowing us to use their facility for the forum tonight. Our forum has been videotaped and can be viewed on our website lwvnorthwestwayne.org around the 24th of September. We also thank the candidates for their willingness to serve the public and to the audience for such thoughtful questions. All of the candidates were also invited to participate in the League of Women Voters Voter Guide, a publication that you can access online 
by visiting vote411.org at the end of September. Print copies will be available in the libraries in early October. We urge voters to review the responses of the candidates on the voter guide before voting absentee or at the polls on election day. This is especially important this year since for the first time in over, in over 100 years, Michigan voters will not be able to vote using the straight party ticket option. Remember to study all the candidates and vote the entire ballot, including the nonpartisan judicial and ballot proposals. Election day is November 6th and the polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. If you vote in person, you will be asked for a picture ID. But if you do not have a picture ID or don't have it with you, you can still vote by signing an affidavit of identity. We urge you all to be participants in our democracy by making educated choices in the November election. This concludes our forum this evening. Thank you for coming.